Hey, this is your word for the day for Tuesday. I'm Pastor Greg, and I've got a question for you. Do we often understand that the mission of Calvary is change lives, but do we ask ourselves how exactly do our lives get changed? How can our lives be transformed? In Mark chapter 9, uh, Mark records for us an incredible transformation about how Jesus changed from the form which they knew him into a new form, a completely transformed kind of thing. Mark 9, chapters, chapter 9, verses 1 to 10 say this. Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, that there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God present with power. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His clothes became shining exceedingly white like snow, such as no launderer on earth could ever whiten them. And Elijah appeared to them with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, because he did not know what to say. They were greatly afraid. And a cloud came and overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son. Hear him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one anymore, but only Jesus with themselves. Now as they came down from the mountain, he commanded them that they should tell no one of the things that they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept this word to themselves, questioning what the rising from the dead meant. This event we refer to as the Transfiguration. It's recorded in Matthew and Luke, so there must be something very significant about it. In each gospel, what happened about a week before was a moment when Peter got it right, unusual for him. Jesus asked him, who do you say I am? And Peter's answer, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Good job, Pete. You got that one right. However, from this moment on, Jesus began to alter his teaching to the disciples that he would suffer and be killed and rise again. They didn't understand, how can the Christ die? So this passage begins with a promise by Jesus that there were some there who would see the kingdom of God present before they died. Now, Peter and James and John were the inner circle of Jesus. They were chosen to see what Jesus had promised. It's interesting to note that James was the first disciple to suffer death, and John survived them all. And what they saw was the ultimate confirmation of Peter's confession that Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior of the world. They saw firsthand Jesus in his glorified state as he would be when he comes back at his second coming. Mark is the only gospel describing the detail of Jesus' shining clothes, which was evidence that Peter, Mark's primary source for his book, was an eyewitness. Now there's something that has kept me curious for 40 years. How did they know it was Moses and Elijah standing talking with Jesus? Did they have name tags? Maybe they introduced themselves to those three. Maybe their names were in lights above their heads. Or maybe there is a hint that when we get to heaven, we will recognize everyone there. As to Peter, well, there's a lesson. There's a time to speak and a time to be still. Peter generally messed that up, kind of like me. And true to form, he did the same thing here. It's good for us to be here. Mark records that he really didn't know what else to say. Maybe if we don't know what to say, perhaps we should not say anything. Now, if a cloud from above should surround us and say, in essence, be quiet, it's probably a good idea to stop talking. It's sort of like the first rule of holes when you find yourself in one, stop digging. You see, this was the voice of God in the cloud, for the voice said, this is my beloved son, hear him. Hear him. It, it's a tense that basically means listen to him, do what he says, obey him. Moses was the first spokesman for God giving the law. Elijah was the spe second spokesman for God representing the prophets, telling of God's plan to restore all things. These two Old Testament figures left that mountain. Their work was done, but it was also superseded. Jesus, not Moses, not Elijah, is now God's authorized ruler and spokesman. As God said, it was now time to listen to him. After Peter's confession, Jesus had begun teaching that the cross would be his path to glory, to complete transformation. What God said to those three disciples was that the obedience to Jesus' word would be their pathway to transformation. And so it is for us. 
if we simply listen to Jesus and do what he says, our lives will be transformed. You see, Jesus commanded them to say nothing to anyone else about this event until after his resurrection, till the Son of Man had risen from the dead. And in fact, this is the last command recorded by Mark and the only one with a time limit. Why? Why would there be a time of silence before a time of proclamation? They were questioning what this rising from the dead meant. Jesus was telling them that only by the resurrection would they understand the transfiguration they had just witnessed. The resurrection, the Son of Man rising from the dead is the key evidence for the truth of the claims of Christ. If we're not sure about what to say to those who ask us for a reason for the faith that lies within us, we can always go back to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's always something we can talk about with confidence. But let's also let our obedience to his word visibly transform our lives. People may see our life change, and maybe we won't even have to first say a word. They'll ask. We pray this little word for the day will bless you. Let us know what you think, and have a great one. In Jesus' name, amen.